The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the News Hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Kurt Dukaj co-host Michael McCullough and Perry Haichu and behind the camera and on the boards we have John today making us sound and look good <laughs> so oh yeah it's been an interesting week in the cannabis we had uh, some big news come down <laughs> from the Attorney General huh oh uh, okay let's get into that one first then uh, straight away yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the Nevada Attorney General has, has ruled that um, the doctor's notes are not valid from California. And implicit in that, I would say, are, are doctor's notes from any state are not going to be accepted. And um, uh, this is going to uh, disenfranchise a lot of people. Yeah, it's, it's going to affect a lot of patients. I mean, because a big part of our tourist population that comes here is from California. A disproportionate yeah, amount of I them. Mean, they're our immediate neighbors and uh, they like to come to Vegas and have fun. Um, and there's a lot of patients who come out here and need to bring their meds. And you can't have fun if you're feeling ill, if you're, if you're all cramped up or if you're nauseous or whatever. So it's not just have fun recreational, but, but we're building this tourist industry in the city on the idea that um, that everyone can come here and it's a place to blow off steam and you know Sin City and most everything goes uh, but if you're if you're feeling it like crap you you're not going to partake in any of that oh yeah if, if you're in pain and who wants to even sit through a you know a show you know could be up to two hours long sitting in a chair mm -hmm. I know I have problems doing that without my medication or even simple travelers anxiety from understanding that you can't bring that medicine with you or if there are repercussions potentially or for bringing it or something like that, you know, it's better just to eliminate that and just let people be who they want to be. Absolutely. Well, apparently in a letter from the uh, Attorney General Adam Laxalt uh, to the Health Department Director Richard Whitley, um, he made a recommendation, that he said that a recommendation from a California physician and a driver's license from another state cannot be used to obtain medical marijuana from a Nevada dispensary. And that's... Um, that's going to cut out a lot of business. <laughs> Up to 50% of the business for some of these shops, I would assume. And uh, beyond that, I feel like this is very seriously interfering with some of the legislative intent mm -hmm. that was originally put into that Senate Bill 374 all those years ago now. Yes. Um, that was negotiated. It was hard fought and won negotiated in that, uh, in that session. And for one elected official to well he's I not guess even elected him. actually uh oh okay adam laxalt yeah, but, but the, laxalt the, the person who brought this up to him richard whitley of the who uh, runs the division of health is an appointee of the governor mm -hmm. so he so in that case he's a, a a political guy uh who who is not a big fan of this program and so he's reaching out to to see what he can do to to slow it down well this i think there's a good chance that uh they might get away with this you know the, the division hasn't really you know been super i don't want to say friendly but uh, on the liberal leanings of some of these policies they'll always err on the conservative side we i've seen so i would expect them to maybe not immediately jump on this but i would uh, of course give a serious look of course i don't think that this is the law i don't think just because mr laxalt decides to issue a memorandum that it becomes policy the division actually has to move and adopt that policy as their right. own so i'm not exactly sure when the next meeting is or what can be done to um, i don't want to say put the brakes but kind of uh, tell our side of the story again mm -hmm. <laughs> before this comes down but you know it's just beating the same old dead horse you know we, i thought i thought we had already won this war or this battle at least and here we are rehashing these old issues once again and i i think you're right that the division is pretty much going to do what it wants here because when you're talking about 
out-of-state uh, residents who are just coming here for a short period of time, their voices are not going to be heard in these hearings. Right. Uh, they're not local, they're not constituents, and so they will be largely disregarded. I think the only people who can make a, a big stink about it uh, will be the dispensary owners and the workers who are uh, who are going to say, look, if, if you carry through with this, we're going to lose our jobs. And maybe there's an in there, but largely, uh, yeah, I agree with you on that. Uh, yeah, and the, what, what the law says is that you have to have a state-issued card or the equivalent of a state-issued card. So what's what's next on the horizon? Are they going to say that that letter you get that for, that's good for 60 days before you get your card? Are we going to stop taking that from Nevadans? I mean, because that's not a state-issued card. Didn't that's, they already try that yeah, once? They, they, yeah, they did. And they just <laughs> fixed it this yeah, year. They, I mean, so did, did all this all this fighting over this, it's, it's just really kind of kind of stupid. I mean, a patient is a patient, regardless of what form they have. They should be able to, I mean, out-of-state patients should be able to have just a doctor's recommendation. Or if they don't want to take out-of-state doctor's recommendations, why don't they allow them to see a doctor here and get a doctor's recommendation here and buy with the Nevada doctor's recommendation. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that there you know, would be the equivalent. I mean, obviously we can't force them to get a Nevada card because one, they can't because they're not a Nevada right. resident. Right. Two, by the time they get the card, they'll already most likely be home because it's taking about nine days, nine to 14 days to get your card. So, but. but I, I think the, the counter to that is that, you know, if you have a patient who uh, is coming from elsewhere, we can't assume that just because they're coming to Vegas that they're, they're, they're wealthy and they have a lot of disposable income. A lot of people with uh, personal health issues uh, have financial issues as well because it, it, it costs, it's expensive to be sick. And to force these people to then go to the greater expense of coming to Vegas and taking time out of their holiday to go to a doctor and then to go to a state office, even the one on Sahara that issues on the same day, is um, is just unduly burdensome. And, and not only is it burdensome, but I think that, that in the, the spirit of this violates the equal protection uh, uh, amendment in the Constitution. Uh, I can't think of another single uh, legal medicine that they enforce this with. If you have, if you have an out-of-state prescription for your Vicodin or your Lortab or your insulin or, or you know, your heart medication, anything like that, those are all controlled substances. Yet the state does not get involved in this, and the state's perfectly fine with, um, with out-of-state doctors making these recommendations. You know, we are still seeing a, a government, by and large, in the throes of that um, reefer madness mentality. Same issues you've been dealing with for decades. Um, it's just round. It just seems like round and round we go. You know, the old whack a mole when we knock one issue down, another one pops up to uh, to deal with. Unfortunately, I mean, <laughs> th there seems to really be kind of no end to it. Um, I'm not exactly sure what can be done to permanently. I mean, I thought this was in the state constitution to tell you the truth, and everything was kind of locked up. I wasn't aware that this was even. Of, uh, able to be changed without legislative a mm -hmm. official action. I wasn't aware that the division had the authority to just up and decide to do this on the behest of somebody, but this seems quite serious. Well, the division so. is part of the executive branch, which is a co-equal branch with the legislature and the judiciary in, in our system of checks and balances. And so uh, there's a lot that they can do. Now, you know, Obviously, I, I'm a progressive, and and I, I, you know, I speak in that direction a lot, and, and you know, I'm I'm not hitting on uh, on the Republican Party or anything like that. Uh, but here in the state of Nevada, since at least the turn of the century, we have had Republican governors who are, by and large, socially conservative. Now, mm -hmm. Governor Sandoval is much more moderate than our past couple of governors. But what what these people would do is these governors is they they appoint political cronies or people who are like-minded to them to these state agencies who are the ones who are actually making the policy. The legislature just kind of drafts and, and regulates the broad brush strokes and then they leave it to an individual agency to come up with the fine details and so if you have uh, 
socially conservative people who are in charge of this and people who are not sympathetic to the needs of patients, then they're going to do everything they can to slam on the brakes of, of any sort of social change. So, and, it, and it's it's not even a, a Democratic, Republican issue. It, it's more of a of a conservative versus compassionate issue. Fair enough. So, uh, Fair you know, enough. and and you have you we do have uh, people uh, at, uh, who are in the industry who are uh, speaking out against this. David Goldwater, who's an, uh, an owner at In Your Fine Cannabis, said uh, in the Las Vegas Sun that not only is it important for our business, but for the patients who need this medicine while they're visiting here. And he argued that over 90% of an estimated 1.5 to 2 million California medical marijuana users choose a phys physician's recommendation over a state-issued medical marijuana card to avoid additional costs and registering with the state. And, and, you know, that second part, that registering with the state, is where I hear from a lot of patients why they don't get on a state program, because they have a scarlet letter on their forehead any time they register well, with and the it's state. true <laughs> and, you know in Nevada uh, for the first nine years of the program they were sharing that patient uh, data with the federal government in, oh in I have reason to believe candidate. that they're still sharing that information with a lot of entities otherwise how would they have the information to decline uh, firearms potential firearms purchasers from that with no potential criminal right you know I, I have all kinds of questions about how this information is coming into uh, the various entities hands in the first place whether it be through back channels mm -hmm. or official emails or whatever but you know it, it's it's like you said you know the people speak and we want we want these things to be implemented but they always seem to find inroads around it to uh to try to discourage people from doing this it well, seems and sure. i don't want to say the infamous they but it kind of is the infamous they but but we have a case where now over 80% of the United States uh, citizenry supports the use of medical cannabis and the legalization and the regulation of it, and yet less than 50% of politicians, elected politicians, yeah, still do. Yeah, well, They're for very sure. Much behind That's because curve. we don't really have a yeah. direct democracy. It's a representative government, supposedly, and these people don't uh, speak to the will of their constituents a lot of times. They speak to their own supposed inner moral compass that guides them to these decisions or or quite or, often they speak to the the, the, the big money yeah, that the has helped yeah. them get elected and that's their true constituency right so um but we, we do we do have some good people out here on our side on this in legislature we absolutely got, sure uh, patricia farley who is uh right now she's planning to present an opinion uh from the legislative council bureau in favor of keeping the notes as part of the reciprocal reciprocity measure sorry i always get that word wrong um to uh as as a counter argument against blackset's recommendation mm -hmm. so and patricia farley has been one of the big people that helped get this law passed along with tick seeger bloom and she sits on the Le legislative council bureau for this with tick seeger bloom so we have some people giving a little bit of pushback uh on our end and i'm sure the dispensary owners are going to too because this came as a surprise to all the dispensary owners. They had no idea that the Health and Human Services reached out to the Attorney General on this matter. So. Yet, yet at the same time, Senator Farley, had, um, you know, who was obviously a, a proponent of, of these, these changes in the last legislative session, she said that a recent crackdown was taken to ensure the legitimacy of Nevada's medical marijuana industry. And I don't know how she gets to that statement. Uh, you know, I don't understand how um, Patients coming in from another another state with the with their recommendations, uh, but without a state card, could possibly be delegitimizing. I just industry. don't think they like these dispensary owners and tour operators being clever and looking for the loopholes in the law. They don't really appreciate that, and I think they took it personally and decided to do what they could to shut it down, because that wasn't directly in the bill they probably weren't licensed directly as a like okay the tour guys probably are not incorporated as a medical marijuana entity they're just like a mm -hmm. referral service you know but they're bringing in all these out-of-state patients which it doesn't make any sense to me why they would hate it because the state is getting paid by these out-of-state patients with the eventual revenue mm -hmm. so you know, I don't really understand where the bad in this eventually is because all these people have been vetted by physicians in California. So it's just, it just boggles my mind how these people make these leaps and how they say, you know, like you said, the delegitimization by doing this, I don't understand, like you said, how, how, how I, I'd wonder if there were other businesses uh, here in Nevada who are um, 
quietly supporting this uh, crackdown because when people come to, to Vegas or come to Nevada as tourists, uh, and let's take Vegas for example, the LVCVA, uh, which is the Convention of Visitors Authority, uh, says that the typical uh, visitor is going to spend X amount of dollars in each visit and they break it down to how much they're spending uh, for shows, how much they're spending for lodging, how much they're spending for dinner and various other attractions and you know if that is the case that they say the typical tourist is going to spend I don't know I'm just going to grab a number five hundred dollars okay. then it's a zero-sum game and so if they're taking a uh, hundred dollars of that out of out of their general budget to go buy medical cannabis because it's available here in the state then somebody else might feel like they're going to lose right okay so I, I, and I'm hmm. not saying that that's absolutely what's happening, but I not can room understand in, that. Not enough room in this town for the two of us. <laughs> that, that does seem to happen a fair amount. Well, so. I, don't, I don't see, the only, the only industry I could see really maybe being hurt by it would be the alcohol industry because people are still going to stay in their rooms. People are still going to gamble. People are still going to go to the shows. Mm -hmm. you, know, they're, they're, you know, they're still going to eat. So, I mean, all the normal Las Vegas stuff if you're a medical patient or not, you're still going to go. It's not like I'm just coming here to use medical marijuana and then going home. They're coming to Vegas to oh, go on a trip. they're trying to have fun. So it really shouldn't impact any of the other businesses. I, I think it would have actually less impact on the uh, alcohol industry than on the gaming industry mm -hmm. because you can go into a casino with a roll of nickels and drink yourself blind if you want. But um, if there is going to be discretionary spending that gets hit, uh, it's going to most likely be uh, that spare slot machine or craps table money that, that people might bring in. And uh, those casino corporations are the big power players in the state. No yeah, doubt. and I'm not exactly sure how much casino player or how much cannabis patient. That's that's the point. I don't, you know, if, I don't if know. you're not alcohol, you'll you're just you're invincible and you'll gam gamble your yeah. ass away. But if you're if you're uh, highly medicated, you'll just look at the slot machines and say, "Ooh, look at the pretty lights." I was gonna say, let me, you know, I, I, I've been to these, you know, cups, various cups in California, and mm -hmm. everyone, you know, being from Las Vegas, it's an automatic geographical advantage to everyone I come into contact with. It's an instant icebreaker. Everyone wants to talk about Vegas, has questions, various, you know, conversation starter. It's mm -hmm. wonderful. People in California, these cannabis consumers and you know, users and business owners, I talk to them, and very rarely do they go, "Man, I can't wait to get to Vegas, hit the craps table." or anything like that like it just doesn't come up often in conversation about gambling and maybe maybe the gaming entities have become aware of that or not i'm not exactly sure whether they've even done demographic studies about that or, or whether they have or haven't oh yeah I've, but, I've seen studies of that over the past 20 years which show a, a steady decline of the percentage of the discretionary budget that people are bringing here going to gambling so mm -hmm. so their revenues have been going down and which is why so many places have been looking for non gaming, non -gaming revenue. revenue yeah that's right well it's a resort town now mm -hmm. you know it's not a gaming house anymore they have everything and the game I don't want to say the gaming's the side gate because it'll always be always be the primary but you know back in the day they they didn't have the uh, the amount of infrastructure invested into some of these properties that mm -hmm. they do now it's unbelievable I think that started basically like what with the Mirage was the real the yes. first real super resort yeah and, and now each one has to outdo the other. So you've got billion dollar yeah. investments there. So I think we'll uh, take a quick break here right now and we'll be right back. Yeah, everyone. Nevada Pure is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, in a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well-being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? 
Well, the answers to these questions are simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency, all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing DigiPath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the DigiPath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. So we're just talking about the Attorney General in Nevada here. And uh, Perry, you got a new story up here. Don't you? Well, we spending were, money. Yeah, spending we were talking money. about discretionary spending here in yeah. here in Nevada and how it might affect certain businesses. So this is kind of a strange story written by Chris Roberts from Cannabis Now. And they're talking exactly about that. What's left over? What kind of discretionary spending do you have after spending rent money on you know rent, groceries, student loans, etc.? And uh, the surprising answer is supposedly the average cannabis consumer spends about six hundred and forty seven dollars on f cannabis flowers per year according to a study that seems a little low <laughs> a very very low maybe uh... they're taking this on a very broad turn uh, apparently they took this over all kinds of demographics mm -hmm. they s collected all this data from all these dispensaries and had the average average price of sale and average age and you know the average age of the consumer is what 37 years old and most buys are made by men um, it's really millennials who are keeping the industry afloat right now half of rec rec half of recreational cannabis consumers are between 21 and 34 the survey found with the flower power generation the least likely to stop at the local dispensary less than 10 percent of consumers were over 60 years old <clears throat> impressive what are you what are people buying exactly it's bud of course and uh you know they're, they then they break it down oh you spend this much per visit and this that and the other but the long and the short of it is people are spending supposedly about 650 bucks of discretionary of their discretionary income per year on on, on grass that doesn't sound like yeah. much i well, i agree with you at, at prices out there are 400 dollars an ounce or yeah, i've spent that much in a month before <laughs> there you go uh, but i would say that there were a, a number of years where i didn't spend a cent on cannabis mm -hmm. because I was in the program and I was growing my own yeah and so you know that gets factored in there but a lot of studies have shown over the years that uh, cannabis use tends to be highest among young adults and that uh, the use tapers off as uh, uh, as as people get older um, although the highest demographic in the state program is the 55 to 64 yeah, right, right. So, but they also they also mentioned recreational in there. Yes, I mean, as as a medical patient, yes, that's very low. I mean, go through that in a month yes. without without even thinking about it. But as a recreational user, you figure the reg usual recreational user is going to be kind of a weekend smoker. Um, they don't smoke during the week because they're working, and they have the weekends off, and they go out and they you know maybe smoke one or two joints with their friends and so if you're doing it that way think of an eighth would last you a couple of weeks well i guess know? when you put so, it that way it doesn't seem so ridiculous but i you know, most of the people i come into contact with uh that are consumers are not so casual <laughs> yeah. let's say yeah yeah i could have a a friend come over who could go through that in an afternoon yeah look what you've got i'll start rolling and when you start, and of course, when you start using the concentrates and that, it, it adds up really fast. Yeah, it gets fast. expensive I mean, real quick. You, you can go through a gram of wax, you know, by yourself in an evening if you wanted to. <laughs> Absolutely, so, I easily. Know, I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, th through, the, through the years that I was working directly with patients, what I found was that I would say they averaged about an ounce a month in their use. Uh, although, the reason that they did that was financial because it was just too damn expensive. And that uh, talking to people who were growing their own, who had access or who had, had the money, uh, it was more like an ounce a week. And so uh, yeah. a lot of people due to the market forces were actually under medicating for their conditions. And, and so you can have people say, oh, well, that doesn't really work for no. you. Because look, you still have pain in this and that. Sure, and some people with too much enough. disposable income have potential to over medicate. <laughs> and on another on that note when you said 400 dollars ounces i we're we're 
we're way below that here in Nevada now. Well, now, okay. Um, one, I'm one, one, of our, one of our sponsors of our show, Essence, mm -hmm. Essence uh, uh, Vegas, they have three locations in town. I just received an email from them yesterday. They have seven strains, all over 20% THC, for $200 an ounce right now. Right now, but yeah. but I'll tell you what, if uh, if this initiative passes, question two passes in November, as we think it will, uh, you're going to see, uh, you know, $25 an eighth uh, medical turn into $75 an eighth recreational overnight. It'll be... It'll be amazing. Well, if it passes in November, it's it's about a year till it goes into effect, and hopefully by then we'll have more of the big grows that'll be open and more of the supply, so it shouldn't affect us as much. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to go into effect in November or right in January. Right, of course. So we, well, not not the retail, not the selling of, mm -hmm. but I think that the actual uh, possession, the criminality yeah. of the possession will go away very quickly, I think, by the end of the year. Yeah, So, um, but they still won't be able to just walk in and buy it at our dispensaries yet so no. that uh, that that cushion we really need that cushion in there because we need more of the grows to come on because as, as we all know everything is supply and demand mm -hmm. when it comes to you know comes to stuff like this and if if it were to go into effect in november and we have the same amount of grows now yes i mean our medication would probably triple mm -hmm. but the fact is we got a lot of these grows that are starting to come online now a lot of them are you know 60 70 80 percent done so hopefully by the time that the law goes into effect we have a lot more of these big grows in in operation which in turn will give us a greater supply and it shouldn't affect us as much but i'd also say though if you're you know you're talking about prices uh being dependent on supply and demand which obviously they are uh the fact that you're saying that um uh, that these dispensaries are now offering uh, multiple strains for in the 200 to 250 dollar range indicates to me that there's a lot of supply out there. Of course, not right as now. Much demand and and this whole thing that we were talking about in the last segment uh, about the attorney general uh, cutting out a big chunk of uh, <laughs> uh, of patients is only going to uh, reduce demand and increase supply. Oh yeah, the, the, the glut. Yeah, the glut will grow mm -hmm. drastically. So, you know, it's hard for these, like these, these massive growth facilities who built these big, big, big operations, you know, uh, it's hard for them to turn the lights off at half their mm -hmm. facility because, you know, it, it's just killing the their, same rent. They still yeah, got general overhead. They're it's just, it's just up, killing so. their overhead. It's, it's just mm -hmm. absolutely killing them. And if you can't justify making that much product, you, you got, you got big problems. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard rumors when this first got started that some of these first couple teams that were outgrowing they were able to charge quite a hefty premium mm -hmm. on some of their product originally and i i think you know those uh, those days are are over mm -hmm. <laughs> There's Good. there's still two two grows out there that are charging over three thousand dollars a pound. Wow, to the and getting it and getting it. Yeah, that's impressive. So, I mean, we do have we do have the the two hundred dollar ounces available as patients, and yes, they can go all the way up to three fifty for you know your higher end top shelf stuff. But I mean, for the fact that just to walk into a place and have a selection of seven strains, all tested, mm -hmm. all safe, all of them over twenty percent for two hundred dollars i mean you, we've come a long could, way there, there's no way you could find that on the street no way well i, I think what's <laughs> happening here in nevada though is that the collapse of that wholesale price or, or the diminishment of that wholesale price is happening a lot faster than elsewhere when when i was in colorado in 09 and 10 uh the average uh wholesale price was about four thousand a pound to dispensaries Jesus. and over the course of the next two and a half years up to the legalization vote that price dropped to the point of 2500 or so we're seeing the same thing happen in Nevada, where at first uh, you were getting these uh, these growers with such limited supply out there being able to get four thousand a pound, but within a year that price has now collapsed to twenty seven hundred or so, from what I'm hearing. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I, I've I've heard it as low as eighteen hundred. Yeah, some, but you know <laughs> that's. You know, you kind of that falls along things you get what you pay for too. So yes, I mean, of course, I've seen of course. the eighteen hundred dollar a pound stuff, and uh, I I turned it into cooking cooking oil. <laughs> well, you know, you're you're always going to have. I, I think when legalization hits, and even in the medical market, you're always going to have your, uh, you know, fifty dollar an ounce. Mexican swag night train type of pot, your, your $150 an ounce Budweiser pot, and you'll still have your $400 
plus an ounce boutique winery pot. And uh, you know, and what you're saying is that these people are, are out there getting greater than three thousand dollars a pound right now uh, on the wholesale level, and that shows that they're they're trying to be boutique. They're trying to keep those prices up. And you know, the the flip side of that though is they all they all took such big spaces because they're counting on rec that it's turning around and biting them in the butt right now. <laughs> If this thing with the attorney general sticks and recreational doesn't pass, or uh, yeah, the, 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 I, we're in a world of hurt as a patients. A lot of point. people are going to go out of business. They oh, won't absolutely. be able to make it. I mean, I'm, I don't even want to. I don't even want to think about it right now. Well, not only a lot of people going out of business, a lot of jobs would be lost. Yes. Oh, sure, lot. sure, and all that you know, all those high hopes for the for the K twelve revenue and all that kind of crap, all that. Sh sh Yep. Out the joint, register to vote. Don't forget. Yeah. Don't I, forget. I, I, I don't think we'll go back to where we were, where we don't have any access. But our access. Will no, definitely there's a couple drop. of shops who have stayed small and didn't get too ridiculous. But it's like you, it's like you That's said. You know, smart. everyone's got big dreams. You know, big ambitions. Go big or go home. You know, take that risk for that big reward. And you know, all those, all those uh, rah 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 things that you tell each other in the board meetings when you're putting these blueprints together. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, blue skies up ahead. But you know, a, a, a good thing about this, though, I mean, we're we're hoping that this, uh, this initiative will pass in Nevada uh, this year, and it's on uh, uh, on the ballot in at least seven other states, medical or, or rec. Um, it's really being normalized at this point, and one of the biggest normalizations I can possibly think of is the Oregon State Fair, because state fairs in this country in general are heartland conservative america farmers sure. and breeders and this stuff and and now in oregon they're coming up with uh uh with cannabis plants on display and, and going to be awarded at the so fair. i heard about this they're going to be displayed will the oregon state fair issue first place prettiest bud prize is that what the, is this more they're, of a display or is it like a rose competition yeah, it, it is a competition they're going to be doing <laughs> well they're not going to be sampling it's going to be based off just the visual of the cannabis okay and probably the smell right. um but they're doing it for each style they're going to have a blue purple or yellow ribbon to win so and, and they I, had they had people actually test out the uh the strains uh, before the fair there's not they're not smoking that's it so up funny on site, but they <laughs> so they they've made this decision before but it just strikes me that um you've got this real heartland america type of um uh, type of event uh that is now for the first time opening up to uh the the cannabis uh consumer and the cannabis industry who um how are those things usually done at state fairs? Is it like a panel of judges who does it, or is it like public vote, or? Panel of judges. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very, 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 very interesting. I would love to see how this plays out over the next few years. Will this spread to Washington? Because I remember a few years ago, they were talking about they used to have farmer's markets mm -hmm. in some of these places where- In California. The, yeah, the growers would come and there'd be this big thing. You'd come around and shop around. Could this be the beginning of the reintroduction of some of that normalization into a public forum like that? I think the normalization is happening because you've now got 25 states that that have medical cannabis laws, and if you if you can if, if you include the ones that have CBD laws, mm -hmm. you're up around 35, 36. Right. So really, the country is normalizing this. The the war on cannabis is going to end, and we'll just well, it's, it's just a, a one, matter of time. like a step forward, a step back at the same time. Because mm -hmm. I see this all the time. Like I said, we got it in the state fair, but they took away the farmers markets. You can allow it to buy recreational pot, oh. but they took away a lot of hash bars and things like that. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a guy at the Champ Show that had a dab rig box that had six different displays on it for a hash bar, where you could put six different leads in it for a whole thing and he's like well now that hash bars are gone we don't really have a, a direct market for these but we have this inventory so we're not going to throw them away and the, and the hash bar not necessarily meaning only hash is sold there but but it's a, a place a to retail, consume uh, on-site consumption place yeah just somewhere to consume on site exactly well, similar to a, a bar that serves packaged liquor also yes uh, well yeah. it's a bar that instead of going and drinking you're consuming your cannabis. You're well, being people, safer and smarter. Well, exactly. people think that's such an outrageous thing. They say, well, you can't consume on site, but it's like I have been to places like the Office Bar over on Paradise Road mm -hmm. that will sell you a six-pack of beer and also serve you a beer out of the tap if you so choose. They right. have both licenses were grandfathered in originally. Right. It's just the way that was written back in the day. The world doesn't collapse because a, a couple dozen places chose
remove their original locations and keep those grandfather licenses. It's just the way business is done. And I think that's what we're seeing is that the vast majority of American people are seeing that with uh, legalization in Colorado and Washington and so forth, uh, that the sky is not falling. These, <laughs> these states that have uh, that have passed uh, REC uh, are not you know, falling apart. In, in fact, no. they're seeing much increased revenue. No, uh, my aunt is a uh, Kind of a strange bird. She's a real, very educated lady, overly educated, a couple PhDs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, lives in downtown Denver, like right in the middle of a very, I would call a not very nice part of Denver. There's a lot of homeless activity out there, but she loves the the busy scene. And uh, I asked her, I said, you know, beyond, she doesn't smoke pot, she doesn't drink, she's c real square. I said, what has this really done for Denver? And she said, well, there's a lot more homeless people here now, mm -hmm. but they're all very nice. <laughs> and things like that and you know she's never been accosted by any of them or anything like that they're not violent uh, supposedly and uh, she said that it's becoming harder and harder to find a place to rent in denver mm -hmm. because of the amount of people that are flooding to to that area because of the recreational cannabis and she's you know they're throwing up apartments as fast as they can build them mm -hmm. and uh the applications to go to school because she's in a in college for another phd the it's getting harder and harder to get into the colorado schools because so many kids want to apply to go to those schools because of this now yeah, yeah. and i would assume it's having a similar effect in oregon and and washington and people always like to point to the bad potential social ramifications but really it's like you know the jobs and the money and all that there are so many positives to outweigh the potential negatives and all those all those taxes that come in could in theory be used to potentially address some of these new homeless issues that are mm -hmm. coming up if it becomes a problem so you know it's uh yeah, I, I didn't expect that from such a conservative person, well, like you know, a, an honest opinion. It's interesting that you're saying that, you know, there are a lot of homeless people, but they're all very nice. Uh, <laughs> former uh, Representative Barney Frank uh, did a, just recently did an, argue, uh, an interview in Rolling Stone magazine, and uh, he slammed the, the drug war and, and called for the legalization of all drugs. And you know, when asked what the next progressive, front, pardon me, when asked when the next frontier of progressive politics is, Frank said that the lefties should fight to lower the military budget, create a better economy safety net, and end the stupid drug war. He said, we should outlaw a drug if it is likely to make you mistreat others. People don't hit other people in the head because they're on heroin. They hit other people in the head because they need money to buy heroin. And so it's very much the same here. You know, when people are coming to Colorado, uh, is is the homeless factor a problem? Well, I guess it is. But um, for these people, uh, they're willing to be homeless and, and be out there on the street in an environment where they can uh, uh, be less likely to be uh, charged with yeah, where they're more tolerated the life, uh, and, yeah ruined. and the homeless problem doesn't necessarily mean that all these people are moving there and just not you know, all the homeless are people that just move there because of the legal it it, it very well could be a, a a circumstance of the fact that people are moving there now to go to school and mm -hmm. and it, because it is legal and the housing market is now costs have risen like in San Francisco, so the people yeah. that are on the lower end of the income they fall out of the so housing market because they can't have, afford to live. Really, in that a lot of market. people may have become may have homeless. Be, yeah, I mean that that only makes sense that if if your housing costs go up, your homeless your homeless numbers go up too because the people that are on the bottom edge of that that housing market and barely making enough to make rent, your rents go up. What happens to them? Well, it it's also a situation where you know, and th there are no hard, fast studies on this, but you could also have people who are economically, uh, you know, in a, in a tailspin uh, and who become homeless who, will, who have moved to Colorado because they're looking at the increased economic activity and they're looking at the, the p potential of maybe getting a job in this industry, maybe learning something about it. So, um, you know, your, your aunt's anecdotal story notwithstanding, we don't really know what the root cause of this homeless problem is. Right, right, of course. It's just how people perceive it. They say, okay, marijuana has become legal. These are the things that I have noticed right. as a resident of such city. Right. The homeless population has increased, but all these other things have also happened. Yeah. So, you know, you take the good with the bad, I suppose, and you just try to work through those problems as they come up. And there is no perfect bill. There's no perfect solution. And there are unintended consequences that happen when we, when we uh, seek upon these social experiments. Yep.
And speaking so, of taking the good with the bad, uh, we, have to, we have to pay the bills here, so we're going to have a <laughs> quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flowers, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijan, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest lowest prices in town, and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. So, uh, Perry, you got another story? Yeah, we up. got yeah, another how, story. How much, does your, how much does your joint weigh? Well, that varies upon where you live and how you roll and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And what I'm rolling um, it for. There finally might be some clarity. Okay. This study arrived at an estimate based on almost 11,000 marijuana transactions. And, and these the, were transactions that all led to arrests. So you know, they, they were, you know, they, they were quantifiable. Right. But according to two researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, the answer is 0.32 grams, which is a lot what? lower than I would estimate. Um, Burn a third of it just lighting it. Right. <laughs> sounds like a pin joint to me. Well, a lot of yeah. estimates were as high as a gram or maybe even over, uh, but the number typically falls within the range of many estimates that have come before it, which is typically between 0.3 and 0.75 grams. Researchers have long tried to get an average. An informal online survey of High Times readers in 2015 estimated that the joints that they smoked contained between half a gram and a gram, which sounds about yeah, about, I mean, about right suggesting that somewhere around 0.75 grams may be the norm. The government, meanwhile, suggested that the joints typically contained 0.43 grams, according to the internal law enforcement studies, of course. Uh, Pre-roll joints in recreational dispensaries and places where cannabis is legal are usually a gram. They're, they're out here, they're 0.6 or 1 gram. Yeah, it depends on what which shop you get them from, but yeah. But what I, what I want to know is why law, law enforcement's doing studies into how much... It, a joint ways. <laughs> well, they can take studies by on doing that, uh, they they are able to uh, determine how much is being consumed. That's right, consumption uh, rates. How much money is passing hands? Uh, various things like that, and so uh, you know, they and they're most interested in the money, of course. Uh, so, well, well, in a 2007 study, a few researchers got some pot smokers to roll out fake joints using dried oregano to try to simulate typical content that yielded an estimate of 0.66 grams, but with the standard deviation of a whopping 0.45 grams and the relative density of oregano to marijuana is unknown with the moisture content and all that. So there are a lot of variables that at least they were willing to take into consideration and put that right in black and white. It didn't just say, oh, well, we correlated this directly. They had all those controls laid out. So that was nice, at least. And, you know, they published their studies in the Journal for Drug and Alcohol Dependence, just... FYI, <laughs> I, um, I, I bought a, a, an eighth of oregano once here in Vegas many years ago. I bought some fake hash. Very, very disappointing. Yeah, I bought some fake hash in Vancouver once. I was in Canada at night, and this guy spotted a hat I was wearing or something and tried to pass me something, and it ended up being just nonsense. But just you know, soap. Yeah, it was crap. But it happens once in a while. We all, we, all, we it's a game we play. Um, you know, and unfortunately, it's not just a game because so many people uh, have had their lives ruined by convictions in the drug war. And certainly, no uh, you know, as Jack Harris said, the the uh, the worst effect of cannabis is what happens when you get caught with it. Yeah. And you know, Pre President Richard Nixon declared the war on drugs in 1973 after the uh, the CSA, the Controlled Substances Act, passed Congress in 1971. How much longer after that did he name Elvis? Uh 
a drug enforcement officer as he was as he was high as a kite in the meeting as he was mm -hmm. high as a kite yeah, you know prescription but, for cocaine but the, <laughs> the point of that is that in 1973 when when Nixon um, uh, announced this drug war uh, they had to law enforcement had to come up with a method of um, of determining what was an illicit drug and what wasn't and so they came up they came up with a drug test back then with a chemical called cobalt cobalt fire cyanate and this test has not changed since 1973. Now, the rest of the world has changed mightily in that time, but what's happening now is, you know, just like a, a prescription drug that gets uh, taken uh, off prescription, you get generics, the price goes way down. Uh, this this uh, thiosulfate test has been around for so long that it's really cheap, and it only costs law enforcement agencies about $2 to make this, to, uh, to perform this drug test. And the problem is that they're highly, highly inaccurate. And you've got tens but of thousands But they carry weight in court. Oh, absolutely, and they shouldn't, but they, but they do. And in, in part, because over 90% of drug cases these days are plea bargained down. They don't even go to, to trial. They go into the courtroom just to for a preliminary hearing and then for a, a, a sentencing, yeah. essentially. And so uh, with such a huge percentage um, going and being educated in this manner, uh, if you have faulty drug tests, you're convicting... An, a large, large, large number of people uh, who may or may not be uh, guilty of the crime. Uh, you know, Unbelievable. Uh, I saw that, um, you know, they have all sorts of things here that, that oh. test positive and that aren't. And, you know, uh, I'm reading this here, a 2011 report from RTI International uh, in the New York Times magazine. Uh, uh, found that the prosecutors in nine of ten jurisdictions, jurisdictions it surveyed nationwide, accepted guilty pleas based solely on the results of the field tests. And the one that I saw in there that does this is Las Vegas, mm -hmm. and that's just that's a, a real dis disappointment that um, that it happens. And yeah, you know, uh, between 2010 and 2015, re-examination of tests after the field test was done, and this is done in a lab by authorities in Las Vegas, found a false false positive rate of 33%. Unbelievable. It is. So if, if you're at a roadside stop and, and the police, you know, break this little vial open and they put, you know, your substance in it uh, and they say, oh, you know, you're, you've got this control substance, they're going to arrest you, they're going to process you through the system, they're, you're going to have to make bail, which is not cheap, and you're going to have your life generally disrupted. What good does it do you? after the fact when a lab says no nah, you really shouldn't convict this guy because because this isn't the illegal well substance. you've already been put through the ringer at that point you'd have to go file a lawsuit against the police department and go through that whole process and start it all over and how again how many people do that very few because well it's hard to find the resources yeah it's hard to find the resources and the retribution is potentially mm -hmm. vicious yep. so you know i i mean they say justice is blind and it's supposed to be, you know, this, I don't want to say pure entity because we all know it's not. But when I was young, I remember hearing something that said that uh, better a hundred guilty men go free than one innocent man wrongfully go to prison. Right. And that is so not the case because I, it's in the attitude of the people who prosecute the crimes. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is they're looking, I, I feel like a lot of people who do this for a living are looking for the next step up in their career. And the way that they do that is by making talking points, and talking points are made with numbers. Mm -hmm. Numbers tell stories. Example, I heard a prosecutor once say, I've issued X number of felony hours of con or felony years of convictions mm -hmm. in my career. And I said, well, how the hell are you, why are you keeping track of that? Right. Why is that a, something that you should be you know, giving to the world as a, as a stat to be proud of. Because are you looking for, well, like, are you looking for gears? We're looking for new and creative ways to take people's freedom away now. I thought we were looking for people who were f making bad on our society, who were, you know, you're supposed to put people, separate people who were supposed to be away from the rest of us in a cage because they don't belong with us and they can't interact. Not looking for ways, new and creative ways to do so said things. And, and the American you know? public is growing increasingly, um, intolerant of the spending given that we're spending more now on building prisons than we are on building uh schools you know thir yeah 33 percent wrong that's pretty bad like how 
Well, there was just a story I heard last week of a uh, guy who was convicted, and it turned out to be a false test, and he, it was a false test, a positive for uh, methamphetamine, and it was from a Krispy Kreme donut. Oh, yeah, the donut glaze that the they found on glaze. look like flakes of meth. <laughs> yeah, unbelievable. And this poor guy got run through the run through the ringer and everything. and ay, ay, ay. You know, because he had a Krispy Kreme donut, which, well, by the every, way, is legal in all of our states. Well, and everyone made it. <laughs> obvious joke, you know, cop can't tell a, donut, a glazed donut. How, you know, how could you not do that? Yeah. And I bet the cop got pissed. When the guy said it, oh, it's donut glaze. They said, oh, you motherfucker, uh, yeah, you're yeah, making yeah. fun. Sure, probably sure, thought he was sure. poking at him, making fun of him. <laughs> oh, I'm a cop with the donut. And yeah. that probably grinded him down a little bit, which caused the, the uh, turn into a hard contact. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I got another story here uh, that a new poll came out of YouGov.com that says two-thirds of Americans say enforcing marijuana, marijuana laws costs more than it's worth. Hmm. So... That's right along those same lines. I mean, 65% of Americans age 18 and older believe that government efforts to enforce marijuana laws cost more than they're worth. And 55% of respondents say that it should be legal to consume the herb. And that number keeps going up, yep, and, up, up and up and up. Last and year up. it was 54%, now it's 55 mm -hmm. uh, You know, the, the American people uh, are sensible on this issue, and, and they, they know that because more than half of Americans have tried cannabis at some time in their life, and, and so they know that it's not this reefer madness debilit debilitating drug. That's a great stat, but I need that language clarified a little bit. I need that to say that percentage of prospective voters polled Mm. say this not yeah. just you know what i mean so oh. once again register to vote absolutely That's all right. right so we're going to start a, a new segment this week uh, called the point and uh where uh the various hosts or guests will be able to uh, weigh in on their feelings on a particular topic and uh we're going to start this inaugural one with perry because he just had a birthday so happy birthday thank you sir thank you <laughs> well uh, i've been asked to do a certain segment on a specific topic that i feel is kind of important to a lot of patients uh a large demographic of cannabis consumers cannot smoke marijuana due to health reasons or reasons where they have children that they don't want to smoke around or whatever the case may be they choose to use edibles edibles have become wildly popular in the past few years and with the advent or the introduction of recre of medical dispensaries here we have a plethora of vendors now offering these wonderful products for us to sample uh, unfortunately here in Nevada the prices are fairly outrageous we have talked in, at length about how the price of the flowers have just plummeted here in the valley significantly and it's great for the patients but for those of those those people who are susceptible to smoke inhalation the options aren't so aren't so cheery uh, I went to a dispensary the other day and saw a package of chocolate chip cookies from a reputable vendor just fantastic quality by the way delicious but for hundred milligrams of THC it was thirty dollars plus tax which came out to about thirty four dollars and uh, I went online and I used to work at a or volunteer at a shop in Holly on Hollywood called Hollyweed and I went to their website and saw that they had a Corova black bar 1000 milligram edible for forty five dollars so for me to get the same THC amount it would cost three hundred and forty dollars for that same edible so I figured out the math I figured it would take at uh, my Jeep gets 20 miles to the gallon on the highway at three dollars a gallon it would take me eighty four dollars in gas to get from here to Venice and back from Hollyweed. Now, in addition to that, it would cost me about $40 to get my California recommendation, $110 to get a room for the night, and about $50 to $60 to get breakfast and lunch. I could take a vacation to the beach, get my recommendation, go get my 1,000 milligrams of cannabis, and come back and be legal in two states for the same price that it would cost me to get the same medicine from the legal dispensaries here in Nevada. And, and part of that problem is because the, um, uh, the 100 milligrams that you mentioned was a city of Las Vegas requirement that any edible could not be uh, more than 100 milligrams right. in, in the product. Uh, but I, I know that uh, uh, we're working on that. We had uh, Councilman Steve Ross on a few weeks back, and the city is trying to uh, comport with the county. Oh, absolutely. I know we'll get past this issue eventually, but for now, the people who need it their options are limited so I implore anyone who is watching this to address your dispensaries let them know what you're looking for they respond to your to the, your needs as patients so if you've observed the same uh, difficulties with acquiring affordable edibles that I have let's see what we can do together and that's all I have to say about that for now and, and a big part of that also is as an edible 
it's been tested twice because the flour was tested, mm -hmm. then it was processed into an edible, and now the edible has to be tested. Um, one way we can get around this is, is to not necessarily even grow your own medicine. You can buy the $200 ounce at the, at the dispensary, mm -hmm. make it into your own butter. Um, with an ounce, you could make basically eight sticks of butter and multiple dozens of cookies out of yeah, that. Yeah, no doubt. Um, for that $200 plus your cooking supply, so for 250 But isn't that technically illegal? You're not supposed to be doing that anymore? I thought that was just with the blasting, with the solvents. That's, I didn't know yeah, it was the butter. Yeah, that's what the law was intended for, and um, technically the law, I mean, they could do it. They haven't done it. Um, if they do do it, we're going to get behind whoever they do it to 100%, <laughs> um, because, I mean, I understand. We don't want blasting. It's unsafe, but that crock pot with butter or coconut oil and cannabis in it sitting on my counter right. and then strained out is absolutely safe. If I can put chicken and rice and, and all that and carrots and all Why that in my crock pot and leave it in my house for eight hours while I'm at work and come home, Why it's, it's, it it's absolutely the same thing as putting butter and cannabis in there. Mm -hmm. So it's perfectly safe. So Well, you, know, you heard it here. There, yeah. are, there are options, folks. <laughs> yeah, there are options. So that we're kind of running low on time so we got a couple of announcements we have first friday coming up this friday so everyone come Wonderful. on out look for us over there behind the arts factory we'll Always be back a great there time. lots of great products from you know, cuz we just had champ so mm -hmm. if you're looking for some gifts for the significant stoner in your life come on by we're going to have it out there for you also <laughs> next tuesday there. up in reno we're having the first patient meeting by our new new chapter up there in, in the weekend chapter up there, weekend 775. Um, the information's on our website, so if you're interested in up there in Northern Nevada, go to our website, check it out, and get you the address for that. August 28th, our eight year anniversary party. So we're gonna uh, come on out and uh, PPP with us at weekend. Pool 45, party 25 North TP Lane. Yep, exactly. From three to 10 p.m. It's a $20 entry and all proceeds, of course, as always, Go to help our patient program. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then the very next day uh, at the Grant Sawyer building, the they're having a public hearing. Which is hearing. 555 East Washington. Yep. They're having a public hearing on the proposed regulation changes to the, uh, to the program. So this one's an important one. If you can make it out to this one, come on out. Um, let them know your opinions on this. Um, because contrary to what people believe, they really do listen to what we have to say. Um, don't come down with your patient stories. Come down with what you feel needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, they understand that people will are Will there sick. be an agenda available online for people to view so they can get their thoughts together first? Or will it just kind of be, they're just going with it? Or I'm sure they will post an agenda. They generally do. Usually, you know, two, mm -hmm. two, anywhere between a week to two days before is when the agendas can, will come out on them. Where can so. we find that? And we'll, well, we'll, we'll find that out and we'll, we'll let people know in next week's yeah. show because we're just about out of time. So um, uh, I would like to thank you for listening into this uh, episode of the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. This is our 121st episode. 100, 120th, I think. 120th. 120th. That's, still, that's still pretty significant. Well done. So. No, 121, exactly. Yep. All You're right. right. <laughs> so for Kurt Dukach, uh, uh, Perry Haichu, and myself, thanks for listening.